Hi, my name is Frank Chen, and I've got a follow-up presentation to the fundamentals presentation I did about artificial intelligence a little while ago. You can find that on our website. For this presentation, what I want to do is take you on a whirlwind tour of what people are doing with AI in their actual applications. So we'll see some real apps, we'll see some stuff bubbling in the research labs, and I hope you're going to have a fun time. I certainly had a fun time learning about all of them, and I'm excited to share them with you. So one of the ways I've been thinking about artificial intelligence is very similarly to how I think about relational databases. So E.F. Codd invented the term relational database working at IBM Research in 1970, and then Oracle implemented a relational database in the late 70s and early 80s. And basically, since that time, we've watched the relational database get into every important piece of software that you write. So if you think about what you did today, you got coffee, you booked a flight, you bought something on Amazon, all of those things are enabled by the relational database. And it was one of these fundamental pieces of computer science that had such broad applicability, it just got into every important piece of software. And I think AI is going to be like that as well, which is it's going to get into every important piece of software. And one way to think about relational databases is they made it very cheap to store and sort and count information. And AI will do the same thing. It will make a class of things cheap. But what AI makes cheap is very different than what the relational database made cheap. And what I'm going to do to organize this presentation is walk through a couple categories of things that AI will make cheap. And when AI makes stuff cheap, it's going to get into every application and become ubiquitous. And we're very excited about where that's going to happen. And we think it's going to be across all categories of software. So the first category of things that AI will make cheap is that it will make it cheap for vehicles to drive or fly or sail themselves. When it becomes cheap to drive, you'll have beer drive itself from the brewery to the store, which our friends at Auto already showed in October of 2016. Once it gets to the store, it will drive itself from the store to your house over the sidewalks. This is a startup called Dispatch Robotics, which is basically building an autonomous shopping cart that will go the last mile between the Safeway or Whole Foods all the way to your house. When it becomes cheap for AI to control vehicles, we'll have drones that can basically follow you as you do your everyday activities, whether that's running or biking or whatever. And I'm just going to show you this fun clip from our friends at Skydio that are building a drone just like that. Think of it as the drone that will create the most awesome video selfies ever. On a little more serious application, a company called Shield.ai is working on drones that will go into buildings where you don't know who's in there and create a map of that building. So if you think about first responders, either soldiers or police officers or SWAT teams, the danger of going into an unmapped building where you don't know who's in there is very high. And so drones that are able to fly themselves will be able to fly in these buildings, generate a map in real time of that building, and also figure out who's in that building, whether they're friendly or hostile. And we're very excited about drones being used to save lives in this way, protecting civilians and protecting the first responders and soldiers that need to do this on a daily basis, putting themselves in harm's way. Once drones can fly themselves, they can do life-saving work like delivering blood where blood is needed. So there's a startup out here in Silicon Valley called Zipline, which is working with the folks at UPS to deliver blood in Western Rwanda. So there's one collection center in Rwanda, and there's many distribution centers all over Western Rwanda. And sometimes the roads to the distribution centers are flooded or it's dangerous to get through them. So what people can do now at the blood transfusion centers is to order blood. So there's literally an iPhone app where they can order a specific type of blood and a specific amount. The blood gets loaded up at the collection center, put onto a zipline drone, which can fly up to 90 miles round trip. The blood just gets there. It's amazing. The blood is actually delivered by parachute at the very end, and the accuracy on this thing is amazing. It's so fun to watch that crowds gather both on the takeoff and landing when the drone goes, and it's been known to fly as many as 150 trips in a single day. So that's what's going to happen 
when AI makes it cheap for things to drive themselves or fly themselves. The technology will become pervasive and it will seem odd to our children or our grandchildren that something moves but can't move itself and can't get itself from point A to point B all by itself. So that's the first class of things that AI will make cheap. The second class of things that AI will make cheap is seeing and understanding the world. So I love showing this picture to illustrate one of the most uh, exciting AI technologies that's been invented in the last few years. So what you see here is a picture off of Imager, and it's a picture of dogs that look like blueberry muffins, or if you're a blueberry muffin fan, blueberry muffins that look like dogs. And I show this picture because obviously there's pretty high similarity between blueberry muffins and dogs. One of the exciting techniques that the AI community has invented in the last few years is a mouthful, but it's called a generative adversarial network. And the way this works is imagine there are two neural networks. There's one whose job it is to classify dogs. And then there's another whose job it is, is to try to trick the dog classifier. And so it's going to generate pictures that look a lot like dogs, but aren't quite. And this back and forth competition between these two networks makes the classifier network extremely accurate. In fact, the most accurate image classifiers, as these are called, are basically better than humans at classifying the objects in a picture. The way we know is we run contests. So Fei-Fei Li at Stanford set up this thing called ImageNet. It's a labeled set of many, many pictures. And we have computer algorithms compete with humans for accuracy. Humans are about 95% accuracy. In other words, they get 5% of the classifications wrong. The best computer algorithms now are below 5% error rates and headed down. So given a picture, when you were asked the question, what is in this picture, the AI algorithms are already more accurate than most people. Because the accuracy and the cost of doing this type of classification is so low, you're starting to see applications with this image recognition technology inside. So for users of Pinterest, you already know that you can highlight any region of a photo in Pinterest, and it will tell you where you can buy that object. So in this case, we're looking at tea kettles. Pinterest recently added this capability to the live camera. So you can just turn on your video camera inside the Pinterest app and point it around, and it will classify objects as you're spinning your camera around. If you notice one of the labels on this table, you'll see that it says Eames, which is for Charles Eames, the designer of the table in this picture. And this gives you a sense, an intuition of how computer algorithms can actually be more accurate than humans. Most people who aren't designers would look at that picture and not realize that Charles Eames was the designer. But if a computer has seen enough examples of Charles E design tables or chairs, it'll be able to make that classification very, very accurately. Here's another example, and it's one of my favorites. So the fellow in the picture you see in the back is a guy named Makoto Koiki. He used to be an embedded systems designer, but decided to go back home and work on his family farm, and his family farmed cucumbers. I can just imagine him as a kid being required as one of his chores to sort the cucumbers into one of the 16 grades that cucumbers are sorted in Japan. Each grade commands a different price at market. And so what he did was to, he built himself a cucumber sorter. And I'm going to run the video so you can watch this as I describe it. And so the computer here is a Raspberry Pi. He has a robotic arm actuator. And then what he did was he trained an AI using Google's TensorFlow to recognize specific types of cucumbers. As the cucumber is fed into the vision system, the AI takes a look, decides what grade cucumber it is, and pushes it into the right box. I love this creativity to realize, look, the tech makes this possible for a single person to do now. And I love how inexpensive it was for him to create this cucumber sorter. And so as I think about the promise of AI, I think about thousands of applications getting written like this. And if you want to pause for a moment and think about what application in my organization, whether I work at a company or a foundation or a government organization, what application would get better if 
the algorithms could recognize what was happening in the world, make a classification and do something. And I'm sure you can think of one in the next five seconds where that would make somebody's life a lot better. So I love this very inexpensive, super creative use of AI. And I think we're going to see thousands and tens of thousands of applications like this over the next decades. So if you scale that example up a little, here is an example from a company called Blue River Technologies out in Sunnyvale. They've mounted cameras on the back of a tractor. And as the tractor travels over a lettuce leaf field, it takes a picture of the lettuce head and it will squirt precisely the right amount of fertilizer onto that lettuce head given its state of development. And so when AI makes it cheap for us to see and understand what's going on in the world, we won't fertilize fields anymore. We will fertilize individual heads of lettuce. You probably saw the coverage that Amazon got when it announced that it was building physical stores, right? The irony of ironies. But of course, their physical store is going to be tech enabled. And one of the things that they'll have in their stores is cameras in the stores that will recognize what the shoppers are actually buying. So you'll never have to go through a checkout counter because as soon as you pull something off the shelf, it will know and automatically tally the results. So another great example of what will happen when it becomes cheap to recognize what's happening in the world. We're going to see these techniques show up in places that they haven't shown up before. And so I've got three examples of robots here. The top one is an orchard supply robot. And if you ever visit Silicon Valley, fly through San Jose once. The orchard supply store nearest the San Jose airport actually has this greeter slash recognizer robot. And in the picture, you'll see the woman is holding up a nail to the camera. And the robot's job is to recognize that nail and walk the user, the shopper, all the way into the aisle where that nail is. You can sort of see the, the robot has a screen in its belly. And if it can't recognize the thing that the shopper is holding up, then it'll open up a teleconference so the shopper can show the nail or whatever it is to a human. In the lower left, this is a robot from a Mountain View-based company called Knightsbridge, and it's a robotic guard. So the good news is if you are a robot security guard, you can do some things that humans can't do, like you can detect trace amounts of carbon monoxide. You can put all kinds of sensors in the robot. You can record the video of what's happening and so on. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is there are still things that a human armed guard can do that the robot can't, like uh, open a door, doorknob, or go upstairs. But it's exciting to see that we're going to have applications of robots like this because it can maneuver its way around the world and understand what's happening in it. The last example of a robot that I'm going to talk about here is in the lower right corner. That's a robot from a company called Bossa Nova Robotics out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The robot is wandering up and down the aisles of a supermarket, making sure that there is inventory on the shelf. So supermarkets lose a certain percentage of revenue every year just because they had it in the back, but it wasn't on the shelf. So robots can solve that. And then the other thing the robot can do is sometimes product managers pay for special treatment inside the aisle. So you've probably seen the flashing coupon kiosk or you've seen an attractive display of the product. In retail land, what that display should look like is governed by this thing called the planogram. And so what the robot can do is verify the correctness of the planogram. There's literally a startup today where you can have people run into a store and take a picture of the display with their phone. But if you think about it for a second, that really is a great job for a robot and not so great job for a human. And so we're going to see more and more of these robots in different environments that they hadn't been before, primarily because now it's cheap for them to see and understand what's happening in the world. So if algorithms are already better at humans at recognizing what's in a picture, what's the next frontier? This next slide gives you a sense of what researchers are working on now which is instead of just looking at a single picture, they will look at a sequence of pictures and try to come up with the story that ties the pictures together. So if you eyeball these pictures for a little bit and try to figure out what ties these pictures together into a coherent narrative, I bet you you'll come up with it. So what's going on in these pictures is somebody's got a Frisbee stuck on the roof, but he doesn't have a ladder. And so he has this bright idea that Instead of going to get the ladder, he's going to try to kick a soccer ball up onto the roof and dislodge the Frisbee so that he can continue playing with his Frisbee. And of course, 
this has happened to me. The result is actually he gets both the ball and the Frisbee stuck on the roof, right? So there is a narrative. There's a before and after. There's an A caused B. And so one of the next frontiers in AI research is to reconstruct the narrative from a set of pictures and not just to figure out what's in a specific picture. Seeing and understanding the world will enable your favorite search engine to answer queries that it really can't answer today. And so on this slide, I'm showing four examples of technologies that Google is hard at work on. These examples got shared by Jeff Dean, who runs the Google Brain Project. I'm just so excited about these. I mean, just look at the queries that will be answerable in the near future that just aren't answerable today because it's still relatively expensive to be able to answer questions like this. My personal favorite is one in the lower left. I can't wait for a robot to go into the kitchen, make me a cup of tea and bring it to me. So that gives you a sense of what is possible now with algorithms that see and understand the world. I want to move on to our third category of things that AI will make cheap. AI will make it cheap to create content. So what kind of content? So let's start off with basic newspaper articles, tweets, stories. During the last Olympics, two professional journalism outfits, one the Washington Post and then another, the Chinese news aggregator called Toutiao, both ran experiments where they had AIs write coverage about sporting events in the Olympics. So in the Washington Post case, they tried doing simple things like, you know, A defeated B, and here were the times. Toutiao was a little more aggressive and wrote uh, full-length articles about what happened in a game based on the results of the game and video footage of the game. So AIs are getting to the point where they can write basic coverage, who, what, when, where, why articles of this sort. One of my favorite genres of video is the cooking tutorial. You might have seen videos from Tasty, from our friends at BuzzFeed in your Facebook newsfeed at one point, or you might just find them on YouTube all by yourself. Algorithms are now able to watch the exact same videos that you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, and they're basically able to retroactively create the cookbook instructions for that recipe. So in other words, they can segment the video into the discrete actions that are being performed, mix flour, add eggs, put it in the oven, and they're able to figure out the sequence of steps that it took for the people in the video to create that culinary masterpiece. Another great example of what you can do if you can create content. Another example of the type of content AI algorithms are now able to create are photorealistic pictures. The input is the sentence on the top of each of these columns. So it's a text description of a picture. So for instance, the first one in the first column, the text reads, the bird is red and brown in color with a stubby beak. And the output is the last row, uh, the bottom row, where you get exactly what you described in the picture. Now, if you look carefully at the pictures, you'll see they don't quite look realistic yet, or some birds are more realistic looking than others. But this area of research is very exciting. It uses that technique we mentioned earlier when we saw the picture of the blueberry muffins called generative adversarial networks. And it's using the networks to actually create these photorealistic pictures. So this is a very exciting area of research, which will allow us to generate pictures from text descriptions. We can also, instead of taking text as an input, we can take what looks like a hand sketch as an input and also ask the algorithms to generate a photorealistic picture. So that's exactly what you're seeing here. On the left side is the input. On the middle column of each set is the actual item. And then on the right side is the algorithm creating a photorealistic picture based on the sketch. And you can see with some purses it does better than others. But it's pretty exciting to think that just given a sketch, we'll be able to fill in all of the details that you would expect in a photo of a bag with that sketched outline. The next type of content that AI algorithms are generating is actual music. And so we're going to do something fun here. I'm going to play you two musical samples. One is generated by an AI, and the other is written by a human. And so take a listen, and then after you take a listen, guess which one was which. And then once I come back, I'm going to tell you what it was.
So now that you've listened to the examples, I'll tell you that the first fragment was generated by an AI, by a company called Juke Deck out in the UK. And the second was written by a human. So it's pretty exciting to think that we're getting to the point where that's actually a hard question to answer, which one was generated by an AI and which one was generated by humans. I've already seen maybe half a dozen startups that are working on this very problem that will be able to generate music on the fly and think of all the places where music would be necessary. If you're a corporation or an organization with a distinctive jingle or a theme, you can iterate on that theme. You can feed the theme to the algorithm and have it generate a completely new song for your conferences or your podcasts or your commercials, and that day is coming soon. The next type of content I want to talk about is movie trailers. Everybody loves a good movie trailer. I'm going to show you one that's basically generated by a computer. This is for a movie called Morgan. And after you watch it, I'll talk to you a little bit about who did it and what they did. It's first birthday. It exceeds our, our wildest expectations. Nice to meet you, Morgan. Nice to meet you, Lee. I have a 13 year old daughter. You don't get to see her much anymore. <laughs> What? Don't you go down there, Skip. Don't be afraid, Amy. I have to go say goodbye to Mother. So kind of creepy, right? A good movie trailer puts you into the mood, shows you the suspense. So this trailer was created by IBM Watson, and it selected all of the scenes that you saw in the trailer. The soundtrack was actually composed by a human, although... As you heard a few minutes ago, that is also something increasingly possible for an AI. One of the things I think this example highlights is it might be a while before AIs can create a movie trailer that's good enough that a movie executive or a producer would want to show. But it can save a lot of time for the human editor who has that job today. So even if they just got candidate scene selections... And then there's a human involved in the final edit with the mixing of sound and so on and so forth. That's a big load off any human movie editor's plate. And I think this idea of AIs helping humans, you might call that intelligence augmentation, is going to be a huge trend. And I'm going to come back to this idea towards the end of the presentation. We're just now starting the experiments to actually write software with artificial intelligence. Microsoft has a system called Deep Coder that creates software in much the same way that human developers do, which is they go find some sample code and they sort of remix it for their purposes. So if you talk to a developer, they will usually just tell you that they find all of their great code samples on GitHub and Stack Exchange, and they sort of combine it in a creative way based on the needs of their application. And so the AIs are also doing that. So once they've absorbed all of the content, they can actually create the software program that, given a specific input, generates a specific output. And so even programming is going to be something that AIs can at least do part of as we mature. So that gives you a sense of the type of content that AIs can create. So newspaper articles, tweets, software, music, movie trailers, and so on. All right, another category of things that AI will make cheap is that it will make it cheap to predict the future. And in fact, I got this whole idea of organizing the presentation this way from a Harvard Business Review article where they said AI was going to, in fact, reduce the cost of making predictions, which I think is absolutely true. I'll talk about a few examples here, and you can think of this entire presentation as just sort of a riff on that idea. What else will AI make cheap? So let's talk about predictions. 
Our friends at BuzzFeed have a whole framework that identify videos that are performing well in one country that might perform well in another country. And so they have an automated pipeline that highlights videos that seem to be getting a lot of views in, say, English, and suggest to a body of human editors, hey, we should translate this one to French or Spanish or Chinese because we're predicting that it will do well in those countries. Here may be one of my favorite applications of AI of all time, which is to replace the password. So if I could take as input things about you, like the way you walk or the way you type or the way you swipe on your phone, and I could reliably predict whether that was you or not, I could replace the password. And that's exactly what our portfolio company, Unify ID, is doing. They do this great demo where you're carrying your iPhone and you authenticate into a website and it doesn't challenge you for password because it already knows you're you. You walk like you. And then they hand the iPhone to somebody else that the phone doesn't belong to. And in fact, they tried to do this with somebody same height and, you know, to the human observer, walked the exact same way. The person walked around the table, tried to log into the website, and the website refused. The way you walk is one of the factors they can use to predict whether you are you. And so today we use passwords and sometimes with sophisticated websites, you have two-factor authentication. We all know that eventually the algorithms will get so good at using biometric factors like the way you walk or the way you type or the way you swipe and predict that you are you. And I can't wait for the passwordless future. Here's another scenario that I can't wait for. So think back to the last time you called your merchant or your bank. The first 15 minutes of that call were probably something like this. We're glad you called. Who are you? Please prove to us that you are a customer. And then you go through this rigmarole of your social security number or your customer ID or something off your last account statement. And then the next part of the conversation is, okay, what seems to be the problem today? How can we help so I can get you to the right second level support rep? Well, once we get very good at predictions, both of those will be completely automated. So the first part is, you know, whether you're a customer or not, we already saw how companies like Unify ID could predict with very high accuracy that you are who you claim to be. And then for the second problem, imagine that you were just using the app or you were on their website. Let's say that it's your 401k provider and you were on the part of the site where you're going to change your allocation. In other words, for the retirement money that I'm contributing, which funds do I buy? And you kind of got stuck. Now, just looking at the web logs, we can make a pretty good prediction that when you call in, having had that experience, I got stuck making change to my allocation for my 401k, that that's exactly the specialist that you want to talk to. So imagine how liberating and how awesome it will be when you call your bank the next time, they don't ask for a customer ID, and you're already talking to the specialist that can help you with the problem you had. And that's all based on being able to make predictions accurately and inexpensively. Here's some fun research from MIT where they had algorithms watch some soap operas and sitcoms. And the job of the algorithm was to predict whether the characters in the scene are going to handshake or hug or high five or kiss in the next few minutes. So imagine that algorithms were good at predicting what people were going to do and the many, many applications, whether you're a government analyst or you're an e-commerce person looking to optimize flow, if you could predict based on what people are doing, what their next behavior is going to be, obviously that has lots of commercial and intelligence applications. Here's another great example of what happens when we can predict the future. The company Freenome is working on a cancer diagnostic by reading the DNA that's free floating in your bloodstream. So compare that today to the state of the art in cancer diagnosis, which is we'll do a tissue biopsy. We're going to find a suspicious lump. We're going to take a tissue sample. We'll send it to the lab to do analysis. Imagine that you could get a higher accuracy read just from doing a blood sample. So when you were giving blood for your cholesterol screen anyway, you could also get screened for cancer. That's exactly what Freenome is doing. And as your doctor will tell you, the earlier you get a diagnosis, the higher your survival rate for cancer. So if it was inexpensive enough to do a cancer diagnosis, every time you got a blood screen, we're going to save a lot of lives and a lot of dollars out of healthcare costs because we caught the cancer early. Here's another healthcare example, this one from a company called Cardiogram. Using the data that comes off an Apple Watch, they can predict whether you're having one of these abnormal cardiac events. 
When you're having a heart attack, it's pretty obvious. But when you're having one of these other events, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, you can read it off the slide. It's not always obvious to the person having that, that they're having it. And so having the application predict that using the sensor data coming off an iPhone has already saved lives. And so I'm super excited about these class of applications that can predict the future. Are you going to have a heart attack? Are you going to have cancer? And do that in a very inexpensive way so we can get these diagnoses early when the treatment is most effective. So that gives you a sense of what kinds of things are possible when we can predict things inexpensively. All right, I've got two other categories. The next to the last category is AI is going to make it cheap to automatically optimize complex systems. It's a bit of a mouthful, so let's go straight to the examples. Some of you may use Waze, which suggests routes to take if your main route is busy. And you can think of this as the perfect example of a system that optimizes complex behavior. We've got thousands of people taking thousands of streets, and with some intelligence at the right point, we can get people off congested routes onto uncongested routes. And so it's automatically optimizing the driving behavior of people in a particular region. Great example of what AI can do. Another example is getting players on a soccer field to be in just the right place. So this is research from Caltech, MIT, and Disney Research. And since soccer players are now wearing sensors that record their exact location on the soccer field at all times, this is increasingly common in sports, we now have this beautiful data stream of here's where all the soccer players are at any given second in the game. And now we can do the analysis. And so the analysis that this research team did was, can we suggest different places for people to be to minimize the chances of getting scored on? So this was a defensive analysis. And what they did was they compared a specific team on the far left, which had a 69% chance of getting scored on, given the location of the players, with a very good team, in this case, Manchester City, on the right side. And you'll see that the arrangement of players on the Manchester City team resulted in only a 41% chance of being scored on. And so algorithms can now predict and optimize this incredibly complex system of where are players, where's the ball, what's the situation, where is the goalie, and take all of these variables into account and figure out where people should be instead of where people actually are. Here's another example of optimizing a complex system, and that complex system is something that computer people use all day long, and that's a compiler. A compiler turns a high-level language like Python or Java into assembly code that the computer can run. What you're looking at here is AI-optimized assembler code. So it takes as input the assembly language that a normal compiler writes, and it rewrites it in a completely optimized way. Not only is the instruction set much, much shorter, but the resulting code runs 1.6 times faster than the code that's spit out by the compiler today. And so we're going to see AI optimize these incredibly complex things, even programming compilers, using machine learning techniques. More and more companies are using mathematical models to predict things, like how shelf-stable will this beer be? Or what's the likelihood of this plane wing surviving turbulence? Or what's the likelihood that I get better than average stock market returns using this algorithm? So there's all kinds of things that people have built models on. There's a company called SIGOP that can take that model and tune the model so that it gets to be an even better predictor of whatever it was that you were trying to predict. So for people who have existing models where you're trying to predict behavior, are you likely to buy this next thing if I recommend it to you? Are you likely to default on your credit card payments if I offer you a credit card? And so on and so forth. If you already have a model, you can try SIGOPT that will make that model even more powerfully predictive with machine learning. Our friends at Google tried their hand at optimizing electricity consumption in their data centers. Now, as you might imagine, Google, like many of the public cloud providers, consume a lot of electricity. They consume so much electricity, in fact, they make their data center location decisions around the availability of cheap electricity. So they'll put them right next to the hydroelectric dam, where you don't suffer a lot of transmission losses getting that electricity to your data center. 
So it would be a big deal if they could power the exact same workloads that are already running, answering all our queries and showing us all the YouTube videos that we want, but consume less electricity. That's exactly what the Google DeepMind team was able to do. So they took something like 120 variables, which is, is this server busy or is it getting hot? Or is the chiller on? Or is the fan of this air conditioner unit on? All of these variables fed into a system, and they were able to take 20 to 25% of the electricity out of the equation, serving the exact same workload. That may not sound like a lot, but if you are a data center nerd, getting 20 to 25% of your electricity cost out of the equation is a huge deal. And it illustrates one of the things that machine learning algorithms are very good at, which is humans are notoriously bad at trying to predict what will cause what. And after about three or four dimensions, your mind just kind of gives up. Your brain isn't programmed or optimized for that type of mathematical optimization. But machine learning algorithms love lots of data and are able to do this in a way that human brains are not wired to do. Our friends at Instacart applied the exact same technique trying to minimize the amount of time it would take for a grocery shopper and driver to get your groceries to your house. So using a variety of machine learning techniques, they were able to shave 8% of the time that it took for a shopper to get through a supermarket and to your house. So it's a very complex set of decisions that every shopper has to make about which aisle to go to and in what order. And then of course, getting to your house is a maze unto itself. And so Using optimization techniques, they were able to save 8% of the total time it took for a shopper to get to your house. So the last category, and this is my personal favorite, the last category of things that AI will make cheap is language understanding. So we'll be able to understand each other better. We'll be able to understand our computers. Our computers will be able to talk to us. And again, this is one of my favorite categories. So Stanford Research has already shown that it's faster to talk to your phone than to type on it. This effect is more pronounced in Chinese, which is very difficult to type, but it's also true in English where speed typists can go pretty fast, but that small keyboard on your iPhone or Android device is still pretty hard to type on. And so accuracy rates have gotten so good that people who talk to their phones can communicate messages three times faster than typing. I love this example of natural language understanding. It's from the inbox team at Google. The Inbox team launched a feature called Smart Reply, which suggested replies based on the content of an email. It launched originally as an April Fool's joke in 2009. And in February, when I heard Jeff Dean talking about it, he pointed out that Smart Reply was generating 10% of all mobile inbox replies, which is amazing. It's gotten so accurate that it's right 10% of the time, and it's probably right more than that. People just don't choose to use it. So it's already generating 10% of all replies based on its understanding of the context of the message and what the likely replies should be. Here's another good example of natural language understanding, and this one is about creating summaries for multiple documents. When I was a product manager at Oracle a long time ago, Oracle had this product called Oracle Context, which would generate summaries based on text. And it had this genius demo where you could slide a slider bar. And the more you slid it, the shorter the summary got. And it was just this mind-blowing application of AI. And all of those applications have gotten much, much better with the advent of deep learning techniques. A New York-based company called Agolo is using those techniques to generate summaries. You can give it as input one or more documents, and it will do its best to preserve the meaning of that document as it generates a summary. Anybody who's ever had a job where they had to summarize what's in an email or in a document or in a combination of those, the email and the document, is obviously super excited about the possibility of having the AI do it instead of themselves. Here's another example of AI powering natural language applications. And in this case, it's a company called Textio. And what it does is it helps you write the optimal job description. So as hiring managers, we might think that we write very good job descriptions that appeal to the people most likely to do a good job in our roles. But the reality is we bring all kinds of biases and blind spots to writing the job description. What Textio does is remove that bias. It will suggest changes to your document, to your job description, as you write it in order to appeal to the person who's most likely to do a good job at that job. 
A company called Everlaw out in Berkeley is applying this natural language understanding magic to the trial process. So what it can do is can look at all the documents that surface during the so-called e-discovery process of a trial, where metaphorically what somebody does is dump a truckload of documents on your desk, and your job is to go through them and prepare for the trial. So what Everlaw can do is automatically categorize the documents and show you more documents about a specific topic that you might be interested in based on natural language understanding of the actual content of the document. This saves a lot of time and it helps make sure that you don't miss something that would be very important in the trial that you just couldn't get to because you couldn't hire enough paralegals to read the documents. As AI systems get increasingly sophisticated at understanding us, I think one of the things that will become important from a user experience point of view is systems that understand our emotions and can simulate emotions in interacting with us. So our friends at Anki built this awesome educational robot called Cosmo, and they literally hired a Pixar animator to design the emotional interaction style of the robot. I don't know if emotional design is going to get folded into the overall user experience designer's job or if it becomes a specialty of its own, but I am excited about this idea that computer systems will become so sophisticated that we're going to have to bring emotional design tools to the job to design systems that feel natural to interact with. Anybody who's seen Star Trek is anxiously awaiting the day of the universal communicator, the automatic language translator that just sits in your ear. And I've literally heard this demo from startups. And so we're very close to the time that we can just pop something into our ear and hear another language being translated in real time. The demo I heard had me sitting across from a woman who spoke Spanish. I don't speak any Spanish. She was speaking to me in Spanish. And in about a second or two seconds after She was talking, I heard a real-time translation in English in my ear. It was just mind-blowing. And I'm going to wrap up our tour of examples with another example of life-saving technology. So there are two studies here that I want to highlight. Study one basically looks through electronic health records, and based on the data in electronic health records, is able to predict people who are likely to commit suicide. And these people might be two or three years away from that event, but they are able to predict with pretty high accuracy in the 80% range of people who are likely to commit suicide. And then study two is from my friend Yuri Leskovic, who is a professor at Stanford and also chief scientist at Pinterest. He did a study where he analyzed the text coming out of crisis counseling support centers. In my day, you used to call somebody if you were feeling down. These days, the kids, of course, text. We can take that text corpus and analyze it for best practices. In other words, the people who are successful at their interventions, what are they saying? What are are they doing? What is the strategy that they're using compared to people who are less effective in their interventions? And so applying AI in this way will, one, help us identify who's at risk of committing suicide, and then two, what effective strategies can we use to intervene in that person's life? Super exciting. So hopefully you're as excited as I am about the promise of AI. As I said at the top, I think AI is going to get into every important piece of software that we write in the exact same way that the relational database got into just about every important piece of software that we wrote. That relational database arc has been playing out for the last 40 years. And I'm excited for the next 40 or 50 years when AI goes through the same arc of getting inside every important application. So here's how some thoughts on how to get started. First thought is get to know the tools. The tools are improving every day. So step one, get to know the tools. There are a lot of open source tools. In fact, one of the big differences between the relational database and AI tools is that a lot of the AI tools are actually open source. And so it's very easy to get started to see how much intelligence you can put inside your applications. Shameless plug here, as a companion to this presentation, we're publishing an AI cookbook that will guide you through some of the tools that are available today and point you to more resources. The second is train your people. 
So the tools are getting better all the time, but obviously it's people that will use those tools to write applications. There are great MOOCs. There are great online tutorials. And so your job as a leader is to make sure that people in your organization are trained on what's possible and the tool sets. And then finally, let a thousand cucumbers bloom. By that, I mean, give your people room so that we can collectively let a thousand cucumbers bloom. You saw the awesome creativity of the cucumber sorter. That whole project costs less than a thousand dollars, which is pretty mind blowing. Give yourself the creativity and the room to figure out where artificial intelligence can really move the needle for your company in designing software that people love to use and want to use over and over again. Hope you've enjoyed this tour of what AI makes possible, and I look forward to meeting with you again on the next podcast.